will uh, will really really help you. Okay, let's stand for the reading of God's word this morning. Proverbs chapter twenty two. And let's look at the first six verses together. We'll read them responsively. I'll begin in verse 1. We'll begin together in verse 2 and then read every other verse together. The Bible says, beginning in verse 1, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Together, verse 2, The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and fe- riches and honor and life, thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The title of the message today is this, How to Properly Shelter Your Children. How to Properly Shelter Your Children. Let's pray. Lord, today, this evening, I ask that you would help us as we talk about a topic that is controversial, that is disputed and argued. I pray, Lord, that uh, great insight and wisdom would be given, and Lord, that you'd speak through me. And the things that you have taught me in my journey of being a parent, and Lord, even before that, when I was a child growing up in a Christian home, that those truths would be explained in a way that pleases you. I pray, Lord, that someone's parenting style and mentality would be altered for the better today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Well, moms, I want to take just a moment and honor you with um, a little bit of humor, okay? So if the humor comes across as corny, just um, indulge me and laugh anyway, all right? None of that sarcastic stuff, though. Don't be obvious about it. Okay, the vocabulary of a mother, the vocabulary of a mother. Let me give you some words that moms use and what they mean, okay? The first one I have here is dumb waiter. Dumb waiter. What is a dumb waiter? Well, a dumb waiter is one who asks if the children would care to order a dessert. Okay? Feedback. Feedback. The inevitable result when the baby doesn't appreciate the strained carrots. All right? How about this one? Full name. Full name. That's what you call your child when you're angry with him. (laughs) Grandparents, and again, this is from a mom's perspective, grandparents, the people who think your children are wonderful, even though they're sure you're not raising them right. (laughs) How about this one? Independent. Independent. How we want our children to be uh, for as long as they do everything we say. Independent. And for moms with small children, this one is puddle. Puddle. A small body of water that draws other small bodies wearing dry shoes into them. Show off. Show off. A child who is more talented than yours is a show off. All right. How about this one? Who done it? Who done it? None of the children who live in your house. Lastly, bottle feeding. Bottle feeding. This is an opportunity for daddy to get up at 2 (laughs) a.m. All right. Now, if your mom lives out of town, how many of you have a mom who's alive and living out of town? Would you raise your hand? Let's do it this way. How many have a mom who is alive and you don't think you're going to see her today? Raise your hand if you have a mom who's alive and you don't think you're going to see her today. Wow, all the rest of you either... Have a mom, okay, wow, all right, so good. If you have a mom that's in town, go see her. If you have a mom that lives out of town and she's alive, you should really call her today, really. You should call her today. Um, I already called my mom today because I knew I was going to say that, amen? Um, Lionel phones his mother living in Springfield, Mass, and says, Mom, how are you? She says, not too good. I'm, I've been very, very weak. Well, as far as Lionel knew, his mom was in great health. So he asked, why are you so weak, mother? She says, because I haven't eaten in 23 days. Lionel stammers, that's terrible. Why haven't you eaten in 23 days? His mother replies, because I didn't want my mouth to be filled with food if you should happen to call. (laughs) 
Call your mom. Call your mom. Um, this morning, I want to bring a message that addresses the issue of sheltering your children. Um, this is a term that has been mocked, made fun of, and put down for as long as I can remember. And I can remember my dad going on rants and saying, I'm tired of people giving me a hard time about sheltering you guys. And sheltering isn't bad, it's good. And I can remember hearing other people say, well, you shelter those poor kids, they're going to turn 18 and go out in the world, and they're not going to know what hit them. So are both sides valid? Do both sides have a valid point? I guarantee you I could probably poll the room and... It would, it would be split pretty even, those who think that sheltering might be good and those that think sheltering might not be so good. So which is right? Well, we're going to look at that this morning. I, 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 I want to say this, that I propose that you should indeed shelter your children. However, however, if you shelter them the wrong way, you very well could set them up for failure. So how do you shelter your children? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I'm going to seek to answer it this morning. Let's dive right in and see three main points about just how to properly shelter your children. Number one, number one, if you're taking notes, you got an outline on the back of your bulletin. I encourage you to do that. Number one, parental extremes in sheltering. Parental extremes in sheltering. Turn over with me, if you will, to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Verse 1 says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Look down to verse 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. They shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. So, uh, Maxine, you got a quiver full of children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and, 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 and I hope that that means that you are one happy mama. Um, they are meant, children are meant to be shaped, to be formed, to be prepared, uh, to have uh, uh, things put in line so that when they turn 18, you load them up and you fire them off into a sinful world of darkness, and they are arrows of light that go forth and make a huge impact into the world. What does James 1.5 tell us? It says, well, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. So if we ask God for wisdom, he will give us that wisdom in our parenting and teach us how to uh, shape those children in such a way where they can make an impact. So let me give you a couple of thoughts here. Parental extremes in parenting. Letter A, notice, overexposed. Overexposed. When I was a young man, I worked a job at a, a, a peach uh, tree farm, and they grew all kinds of different types of fruit. I was 13 or 14, and I remember I showed up on my first day on the job, and it was, was winter time, and uh, there was northern Alabama. There was a greenhouse with heat lamps turned on, and the sun that was shining that day made it quite warm in the greenhouse. And when I walked in, there were tables all inside this huge greenhouse and there were uh, a, a low, a rows of plastic sleeves of strawberry plants that had been planted and growing all winter long. Do you know what those strawberry plants were? They were sheltered. They were sheltered from the elements. You see, if you had taken the strawberry seed and had planted it out in the dirt in the middle of the winter, the harsh elements would have killed off that plant. And come springtime, it would have had no chance 
chance to succeed. Some parents want to throw their children out there and say, well, they're going to learn about sin at some point, so they might as well learn when they're little. That way, when they get older, they'll be okay, overexposed. My father has been a Christian school, private school administrator for 35 years, and uh, actually, this is his last year doing it. He's retiring uh, uh, here in just a few weeks and going to be heading on to something else. Pray for him if you think of it, but 35 years. Years ago, he worked at a school in Baltimore. He started a school in Baltimore, and he had to expel a kindergarten student. A kindergarten student. You say, well, Pastor Lejeune, why did he have to expel a kindergarten student? Well, this little boy lived with his dad. Mom was not in the scene, uh, not part of the picture. I think you'll know why in just a moment. And the little boy was coming to school in K-5, talking about adult video scenes he had seen at home the night before. In detail. And my dad pulled the little boy and his dad in the office and said, Sir, how come your son knows so much uh, at such a young age? How come he's able to describe in great detail bedroom scenes on the television? And the man said, Well, I look at it this way. He's going to know at some point. We might as well just expose it to him now. My dad, looked at the, uh, my dad looked at this man and he said, Clearly your philosophy of parenting does not line up with the ideals and morals of this school. You need to take your child and go elsewhere. Overexposed. There is the other extreme. Letter B, notice, overprotected. Overprotected. I had the privilege of going to a Christian college, a Bible college that trained me for ministry and loved my experience there. Um, you see folks of all types when you go to a Christian college. And um, I'll say this, my kids are being homeschooled um, uh, for one reason or another. And um, uh, not all homeschool kids are socially awkward, but a lot of socially awkward kids were homeschooled. All right, So I'm not picking on kids that are homeschooled because my kids are homeschooled. Every year they would have a day where they would have all the homeschooled kids come up on the platform and they'd take a picture of them. And not all of the kids that were up there were socially awkward. There were plenty of normal kids up there, but every socially awkward kid in the college was on that platform. Every one of them. Every one of them. You walk, watch them walk by and you kind of scratch your head and say, yep, I figured he was homeschooled. Amy, do you remember that? You remember that, Amy? Remember when they do that? Amy went to the same school I did. Uh, so that was interesting. We had one girl who was raised on the mission field. And this happened years before I arrived. I heard about this from a vice president later. And she, uh, she was just the chastest, purest young lady. Uh, she would have been overprotected. And she came and knocked on the vice president's door, and she was just weeping tears. And the vice president knew the, the girl's dad had been over to, to Africa to preach for him and said, come on in. And the little girl sat, or the, the, the young, young lady sat there. I think she was a freshman or sophomore in college, sat there. And she was just sobbing. And he said to her, he said, young lady, what's wrong? And she finally gathered herself together enough to say, I'm pregnant. And he said, oh, oh, my you know, your dad asked me specifically to watch over you, and you came. And he was really concerned about you being thousands of miles the other side of the world away from you. And, and so he's thinking, the, the worst, i got to call this girl's dad, and i gotta tell, I got to tell him that under my watch that she got pregnant. And, and I knew she had a boyfriend, but oh my, this is a Bible college, and how could this happen? So he just takes a minute, and he says to her, well, tell me what happened. And she said, well, it's like this. She said, um, I've been dating this boy for a few months now, and we were sitting on the bench outside of the mailboxes, and, and he held my hand. And he said, okay. Well, what happened next? And she said, well, that's it. He held my hand, and now I'm pregnant. That's a problem. That's a problem. What a relief that vice president had. <laughs> he called the missionary, and he said to the missionary, he said, Sir, you've got, you or your wife got some splaining to do to your daughter. He said, She's going to come sit in my chair, and I'm going to walk out and close the door, and you need to talk to this girl. You need to explain to her some things. And he left. You can shelter your children in such a way where it's just unhealthy. So you can undershelter and you can overshelter. Number two, number two, notice this. Notice children's curiosity towards sin. 
children's curiosity towards sin. Everybody take your Bibles over to Proverbs chapter number 7 for me. Proverbs chapter number 7. And look at verse number 6. We're going to read all the way down to verse number 23. And I have a good reason for reading this much scripture. Please engage with the Bible this morning. It says, For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. Underline that phrase, the simple ones. Uh, Among the simple ones I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him. And with an impudent or persistent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me this day. Have I prayed my vow? Speaking to the cultural uh, system of their day. Therefore come I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face. And I have found thee. I have decked my beds with uh, coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves for the good man is not at home there's no one that's going to catch us he has gone a long journey he hath taken a bag of money with him and will come at the day appointed with her much fair speech she caused him to yield with the flattering of her lips she forced him look at verse 22 he goeth after her straightways an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that that it, that it is for his life. You know what you have here? You have a simple one. You have a child, a young person, a teenager, maybe an adult who's been overprotected or oversheltered, and he is wandering down the road to the place of a woman who is devious, who is manipulative, who is looking to sink his moral ship, and he is curious about sin. I bet he thought to himself, hmm, I wonder what's down there. I wonder who those women are down there on that street corner. I wonder if I were to talk to them, what would happen? My friend, uh, if you have a child, your child is curious about sin. You say, not my child. I say, oh yes, especially your child. If they have blood running through their veins, if they have air pumping in and out of their chest, they have a curiosity towards sin. I can remember being 14, 15, 16 years old and picking up the back of a movie to see what it was rated and why it was rated what it was rated. I wonder what that strong language is. I wonder what those violent scenes are. I wonder what it means by some nudity. I wonder what it means by some sexual scenes and there being a curiosity curiosity there. I've never seen a rated R movie. I I wonder what's in that rated R movie. How many kids wonder, I wonder what it would be like to smoke a cigarette. I wonder what alcohol tastes like. I wonder what it would be like to lose my virginity. I wonder what it would be like to sneak out behind my parents' back. You say, oh, not my sweet little angel. They don't think that way. And I got to tell you, if they're seven, eight, nine years old or older, I guarantee you there is a thought and a desire, uh, a curiosity towards sin and there's nothing wrong with that because we all have it but as a parent you need to be aware that there is that curiosity they will dabble they will look they will wonder and you must be on your toes to help them through that process you must be on your toes otherwise you'll bury your head in the sand and you'll wake up one day and you'll find out that they have ruined their lives If you're here today and you're in that ladder where your child has ruined their life, I'm not here to throw any stones at you. I'm here to encourage those with small children or those that will one day have children to be aware and to have their guard up and to do it the right way. Number three, and here's where I want to spend the majority of the message this morning. Notice, children's learning of biblical subtlety. Children's learning of biblical subtlety. Turn over to Proverbs chapter number one with me, if you will, this morning. 
morning, Proverbs chapter 1. And here's where I'm really going to get into the nuts and bolts of how to properly shelter your children. Proverbs chapter number 1. And look with me at verse number 1. The Bible says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Look here. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction, look here, of wisdom, justice, and judgment and equity. Verse 4, to give subtlety to the simple. To give subtlety to the simple. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. Now that idea of giving Subtlety to the simple. What does that mean? To give subtlety to the simple. In essence, it means this. To teach your children how to handle themselves in various scenarios. So that they are able to work themselves out of a difficult spot. You think of someone who is subtle. They're careful. They're, they're thoughtful. They know how to slip in and out of a situation. I think of that verse, it says, uh, wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. We've got to instill that and teach that to our children at a very young age, that biblical subtlety. I got to tell you this morning, I was sheltered as a child growing up, but I am thankful for the way my parents sheltered me. There was a day where I graduated from high school and I left home and I went off to Bible college. And Bible college was much different than secular university. Bible college did not have co-ed dorms. The men were in one dorm, the women were in another dorm, and we were not allowed to go in each other's dorms. We had all kinds of rules on top of us. We couldn't touch each other. Uh, uh, if we talked to each other too long, they, they even called it a date. I mean, some of it just uh, fringed on ridiculous. But I had rules over me all the way through college and the uh, Friday I graduated from college, the very next Friday I got married to this sweet gal right here. So I left being sheltered to being completely on my own. You say, oh, pastor, pastor, you mean you were sheltered until you were 24 and then right after that you jumped right out from being under sheltered? How did you do it? Well, I got to tell you, I pulled up to the McDonald's drive through on my honeymoon and I rolled down the window and my knees started to knock. And I thought, oh man, I'm on my own now. I don't think I can do this. And Angela reached over and put her hand on me and I said, are you sure you're allowed to do that? She said, oh, we're married. It's okay. <laughs> and, I, and she said, I know you've been sheltered your whole life. But you can do this. You can order McDonald's. <laughs> that did not happen. That did not happen. Some parents think that if they shelter their children, their children are going to get out from underneath the auspice or umbrella of being sheltered, and all of a sudden they're just going to crumble and fall apart. And I will tell you that if you over shelter your children and they're as naive as that sweet little missionary daughter was, that very well could happen where there is a curiosity of sin that was not adequately explained and exposed, and they weren't able to handle that. And yes, they definitely could step out from under that auspice and explore sin and fall flat on their face. But my friend, as a parent, you've got to be on your toes and you've got to know how to teach them that biblical subtlety. Letter A, innocence, not ignorance. Innocence, not ignorance. Turn over to Romans chapter 16 and verse number 18. Romans 16 and verse number 18. I hasten. I'm, as soon as I get there, I'm going to start reading. So yeah, if you're still turning, you'll have to catch up with me. It says, "For they that are such, um, uh, uh, for they, that, they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience is uh, come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, in your behalf. But yet I will have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Now let's let's dissect this a little bit. Go back to verse number eighteen and notice it says, "And by good works and fair speeches deceive deceive the hearts of the simple." If you mark in your Bibles, underline that phrase: deceive the hearts of the simple. My goal 
when my ch children leave home is that they will no longer be simple when it comes to that which is good and that which is evil. That they will be educated and that they will be principled and that they will know what they want. That their ignorance is gone, but their innocence is still intact. Look at the verse below that, verse 19. It says, uh, again, it says, I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. That, that phrase simple concerning evil doesn't mean that they intellectually don't know. It means that they lack experience in evil things. They lack experience in evil things. The truth is, I want my two children, they don't need to know everything, but my two children need to have a pretty good idea when they graduate from home or graduate from high school, get ready to leave home. They need to have a pretty good idea of what righteousness is and what evil looks like. And they need to have been and taught it intellectually from their father and from their mother. Not from the television, not from some teacher, not from the neighbor kid down the street, not from some friend on a basketball trip. They need to have learned it from me and their mother. Innocence, not ignorance. Now, listen, I got to say today, having been raised in a Christian home, I consider myself a pretty innocent soul, but I'm not ignorant of the evil that's out there. You can raise children that are innocent without raising children that are ignorant. Letter B, notice, exposed, not entertained. Exposed, not entertain. You're already in Romans. Turn over to chapter number 12. Romans chapter 12 and look at verse number 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Now I want to focus on the second half of the verse here. Abhor. That means deeply hate and despise. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. How can you hate something that you have no knowledge of? How can you hate something that you laugh at and are entertained by? To that dad who let his child watch that raunchy rated R, rated X, NC-17, whatever it was, film with him. Um, how can you say that you're raising a child who isn't sheltered? You're raising a child that's being entertained by sin. Listen, there's got to be some morals and standards in your home. Let me help explain it to you this way. Can I tell you something? Growing up, I heard cursing. I saw folks drink beer. I watched folks smoke cigarette. I watched people have live-in boyfriends and girlfriends around me. So I thought, Pastor, I thought you said you were sheltered. Oh, but you have to understand. You see, my dad was a bus captain. My dad had a bus route in socioeconomical poor neighborhoods where broken homes were the norm. And every Saturday, he'd load me into his car, and we'd ride around, and we would see folks sitting on the front porch smoking cigarettes or marijuana or, or who, know who, else, who knows what else they were smoking. I saw liquor cans and beer bottles everywhere in people's hands, on the porch, on the ground, in the trash can, on the table inside. We'd walk in and see folks smoking cigarettes and playing cards, sometimes with money on the table. We'd see different boyfriends go through homes where we'd pick up a, a kid kids and my parents showed all that to me I could remember we'd get in the car and we'd go visit my grandmother and my dad gotten saved as a teenager but his siblings either weren't saved or weren't very mature in Christ and my dad would tell us every time on the way there to see him he'd say now when you get there kids you're going to see some things that we normally don't see your, your, your uncles are probably going to be smoking cigarettes and they'll probably use a curse word here or there and, and, and there's probably going to be some beer at, at the Thanksgiving dinner uh, and, and these are some things that you're going to see but please know that this is wrong and this is sinful and because we've been saved we don't participate that, in that and then on the way home uh, he would talk to us about the brokenness of lives that come from those things do you know that as a young child I was exposed to some pretty heavy sin but I 
looked at those people who had that in their life and I saw the dysfunctionality that came along with it. I saw the broken lives. I saw the bus kids climb on the bus on a Sunday morning and, and stink because they hadn't had a bath in two or three days or, or have food that was dried on their face or hair that was matty because it hadn't been washed. And I saw uh, uh, hearts that were broken and I knew of the testimonies and my dad pointed at the sin and said, if you want to choose to live a life of sin, that's what comes with it. I was exposed to sin at 7, 8, 9, 10 years old, but my dad did not allow us to be entertained by sin. We'd go and we'd hear every curse word imaginable on the bus ride on Saturday. We'd come home Saturday afternoon and turn on the TV, and if somebody took God's name in vain, the TV was either turned off or the channel was changed not to be turned back. Well, why did he let me hear God's name be taken in vain on the bus route, but not on the TV? Because he was exposing me to sin, but he did not want me to be entertained by it. And so many parents will sit there and say, eh, whatever. They're going to they're gonna hear it anyway. They might as well hear it in my house. Oh, if they're going to hear it in your house, oh, sure, don't let them be entertained by sin. God says we're to abhor that which is evil. My dad's getting down in that bus route area. He's bringing those boys and girls to church to a place where they can feel the love of God and know the love of God and have the love of God given to them and pulling them out of a broken home. And he's hating the sin that's destroying their lives and going down in those neighborhoods to get those poor children. Oh, as parents, may we expose our children to sin, but may we show them the devastating consequences that come from it and with it. Letter C, lastly, no is tested, not trusted. Tested, not trusted. Let's finish the message back over in the book of Psalms and Proverbs this morning. Turn over to Psalm 127 and verse number 4. The Bible says, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are ch children of the youth. Now, we think of this in terms of all the modern technology that we have. If I want an arrow, uh, I saw Miss Yvonne here today. I didn't see Brother Ernie. Miss Yvonne, are you in here? She might be in the nursery. I think she's in the nursery. Okay. Uh, Brother Ernie is our church hunter. He kills bears with bows and arrows. It's impressive. And his videos are mind-boggling. I know that disturbs some of you, but... Get over it. Amen. All right. Um, you know, Brother Ernie doesn't go into the woods and get a stick and get a knife and straighten it out. He goes to the store and he buys arrows that are probably metal or some sort of hybrid wood metal that are already polished and shaped and, and they're perfect. But you know, in Bible times, they didn't have all that technology. If you wanted an arrow to be straight, you went out in the woods and you found the straightest stick you could get and you got a knife and you worked that thing and whittled that thing and you made that thing straight and then maybe you would uh, uh, spend uh, days, weeks, hundreds of hours getting that arrow to be just perfect so that when you pulled back and you let it go, it would go as straight as possible. And the psalmist here is painting a picture for us. He says, Mom and Dad, God is giving you a child and you have 18 years years to take that child and work away the sin nature that's in their heart and, and, and get them prepared and ready to not be ignorant, but to be uh, uh, innocent and not to be entertained, but yes, to be exposed on some level so they know what it is. And, and, and you got to get them ready so you can load them up and you can light them on fire and you can fire them into a dark world and they can make an impact for God and righteousness. Mom and dad, you got to do that. I see moms and dads that lord over their children and want to help them make every decision. Listen, that's okay when they're four, five, six, seven, eight years old. When they get to be teenagers, boy, you got to give them opportunities to make principled decisions on their own. They come to you and say, Mom, I'm not really sure what to do about this. Mom, you ought to look at them and say, well, what's the guiding principle that helps us get the answer? You tell me how to make the decision. 
Moms and dads, you've got to give them tests to pass, not an exam in a classroom, a life test. And they need to pass test after test after test, beginning at 12, 13, 14 years old. And when they get to be 18 and they leave home, boy, they already know how to make decisions. And they can walk out that door having been sheltered and protected, and they are ready to go. But tested does not mean trusted. I watch parents very ignorantly and very uh, 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 foolishly take a smartphone or a tablet and hand it to their children and say, here you go. And boy, these make great babysitters, don't they? Well, they kill our children's ignorance, innocence. When I say expose them to sin, you hand them a smartphone or a tablet, and that thing doesn't have any guards or locks on it, oh boy. You're not exposing your child, you're allowing them to entertain themselves with sin. Trusted. You're not to trust them. I want to read one more verse for you, and we'll close it down today. Turn to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26. Proverbs 28. Quickly turn over there. Notice what the psalmist here says about this idea of trust and accountability. Before we read this, just remind you what Jeremiah said. He said, The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? Look, look at this verse. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. 28, 26. He that trusteth his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Now, I am not supposed to trust my own heart. If I'm not supposed to trust my heart, I'm sure not going to trust the heart of my simple one who has a curiosity and a fascination with sin. You know, it's good every now and then to let your children be put in a place where they don't know you're watching them but you are. And you watch and see in that moment when they can choose righteousness or sin, what they choose. They think you don't know, but you know. And when they are about to make the wrong decision, you swoop in and you use that as a teaching point in life. Maybe they got the TV on in the other room and they don't know that you're watching them watch TV. Somebody's cursing or drinking. Somebody's taking God's name or there's some channel put on the TV that you know is banned in your house. Maybe there's a provocative female in a commercial that comes up and your teenage son is sitting there watching. Do they instantly change the channel even though they know they don't know that you're watching them? Test them, but don't you trust them. I've heard moms and dads say, well, I've got to respect their privacy. Ooh. Your children have no privacy? None. Hey, look, if your kids have locks on their doors, take those off and put doors with no locks. You go in regularly and you open up all the drawers and you dump them out. You lift up the mattress and see what's underneath. You take that phone and you know everything that's going on on that phone. You put software on there. You see every website they're going to, going on, everybody they text. You say, well, I don't want to mess with my junior's privacy. You better get in junior's privacy or junior's going to ruin his life. Don't you dare make that mistake. One day, you're going to stand before God, mom and dad, and you're going to give an account to God for the way you raised them, and God's not going to want to hear, well, I didn't want to mess with privacy. No, no, no. If they turn out and they're rotten, God's going to look at you and say, hey, did you do it right? Now, to be fair, to be fair, not every mom and dad who does it right is going to have every child turn out perfect. Okay? Jesus had 12 disciples. One of them went astray. Jesus was the perfect leader. So sometimes we do everything right, everything right, and they stray away for a bit. But most parents that have children stray away, boy, they really didn't train up their child. They really didn't put the effort into it. Can I ask you a question this morning? How many books have you read on parenting moms and dads? How many hours do you spend praying for your kids? You say, well, that's just not my personality. Well, you better figure it out. You better figure it out. Boy, those are arrows in your hands. You're firing into the darkness of this world. And you better figure out how to properly shelter them so that when they turn 18, 21, whatever age it is, boy, they're ready to go out there and they live principle. Let me just finish with one last little piece of advice, and I'll shut it down this morning. 
I can't, I, look, this might be the most important thing I'm going to say this morning. I know some of you are ready for me to shut up and sit down, all right? But, but I've I got to get this out here, so please hear me. You need to make sure your children learn from a very early age that you, as mom and dad, are not the ultimate final authority in their life. That's the ultimate authority in their life. Right there, that guy up there, God. One day, mom and dad, you're not going to have them anymore. But if they hear from the time they're this size all the way up, that displeases God. That pleases God. We do this because God says so. We submit to God, or God's going to punish us. Then one day when they leave your house, they still have God over the top of them. Your eyes may not be able to see everything they do, but his eyes will always see everything they do. You make sure it's not about you. You shift that over to God, and you make sure that they know that God is the one. That God is the one who's directing them. Let's have our heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. Lord, I do ask that you help us as parents grandparents, future parents, to raise our children in a way where they're innocent, Lord, not ignorant, exposed to sin and its pain and hurt and consequences, but Lord, not that entertainment occurs in our house, where they're tested to do right and they live by principle. But we don't blindly trust our children who have a fascination and a curiosity with sin. Help us, Lord, today to see and make right decisions. I thank you, Lord, for the moms in this room. The purpose of the sermon this morning was not to make any mom feel bad about what they've done or are doing. But, Lord, just to point out practical steps, practical truths that will help us raise our children in a way that's honest and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet. The altar's open. The piano's playing. Maybe you have children here this morning.